I'm Rachel Bell, and this is Your Last Meal, the show where celebrities share stories about the foods they love most, and we dig into the history, culture, and science of those meals with experts from around the world. Today on the program, comedian and author Sarah Cooper. Sarah rose to fame in the most modern of ways through TikTok, when she started posting videos of herself lip-syncing Donald Trump's speeches during the pandemic. This landed her on the couches of many late-night talk shows, which led to her very own Netflix show. Sarah Cooper, everything is fine. And now Sarah is releasing her third book, a memoir called Foolish. But before she was an entertainer, Sarah worked at Google. We were gonna like leave the office to go to lunch. And so I went to Yelp to look at like the best places to eat in the neighborhood. I think the first two or three were the cafeterias in Google. (laughs) I secured a very rare and very coveted interview with the senior director of Google's food program so we could learn more about the free meals Googlers are treated to every day. And girl dinner. What is girl dinner? Why did girl dinner go so viral? All of that coming up later in the show. But first, my conversation with Sarah Cooper. Hi, Sarah Cooper. How are you? How are you? I'm good, Rachel Bell. How are you? Good. I just like some people have a name you want to call them first and last name. I think you have one of those names. (laughs) I think Rachel Bell is one of those names, too. Oh, my God. We have twin names, but not at all. But we are both from the (laughs) Bible. So, you know, we were probably friends. I know. Yeah. Yeah. My sister's name is Rachel, but her name has an A in it. I saw that. I noticed that. She probably knows this. When you meet another Rachel, they always say, how do you spell your name? Oh, and it's the same thing with Sarah. Oh, yeah. The H or the no H. Yeah, I don't get along with no H Sarahs. I don't like them either. (laughs) (laughs) It's like something is missing, you know, and they're always trying to like overcompensate. That's what I think. It's like, get an H. (laughs) (laughs) It's like Napoleon syndrome for Sarahs. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, (laughs) that's very funny. Sarah was born in Jamaica and immigrated to the U.S. with her family when she was three years old. And you don't really like Jamaican food. I don't. Yeah, it's a it's a huge bane on my entire family's existence. Oxtail, you know, curry goat, you know, kalaloo, ackee and saltfish, like all of these dishes. I don't know. I just don't really like them. There are some really basic Jamaican foods I like, like um, Johnny Cakes, which is just flour and water, (laughs) which is just fried bread, basically. So I can eat that. But yeah, I just I came here when I was three and I was just immediately like correcting my parents accents. Like if they didn't say a word right, you know, they were saying Suda, which is um, soother. But with a Jamaican accent, it's Suda. And I was like, um, I think you mean pacifier, you know, like <laughs> that's oh. what they were trying to say. And I would correct them based on what I was learning in school. And just the other day, my mom said to me, Sierra, you know, you don't understand my culture. You know, you don't understand. I'm like, mom, you brought me here. Like you brought me here. They did this to me. It's not my fault. They wanted me to be American. And here I am. I'm American. OK, so give me a break. Does the rest of your family or three other siblings, do they like Jamaican food? Yes, they do. (laughs) They love Jamaican food. (laughs) And they also, they kind of have still a little bit of an accent and I I don't really. Wow, that's so interesting. So how does that work when you were growing up? Would your mom make something different for you? Um, Yeah, a lot of times I would eat like cornflakes. I really hated when my rice touched my chicken when I was little. So if that happened, I couldn't eat any of it. Uh So they had to make like a special plate for me. Yeah. So I I basically just scrounged around, got snacks. I would live for McDonald's and I would live for it when we went to go get Chinese food. Like those were like my favorite. I mean, I think all kids really just want McDonald's all the time. Right. Okay. Well, that's, that's good. (laughs) That's good. Yeah. Sarah grew up wanting to be an entertainer, but her parents insisted she get a practical degree. So she got two in economics and digital design. She got jobs in tech, first at Yahoo and then five years at Google. But on nights and weekends, Sarah performed stand up comedy. She filmed a web series. She wrote and eventually she quit Google to pursue writing and comedy. But after several years, two books, but not enough money, Sarah started seriously thinking about asking for her old job back. But then she made a TikTok video that changed her entire life. She lip synced along with Donald Trump talking about COVID cures in April 2020. I put a, the how-to medical video where um, Trump is talking about injecting Lysol into your veins. That one was kind of the first lip sync video that really blew up. Her video racked up millions of views. 
So she kept making them. Trump, he kept talking. And um, there's something about his voice coming out of my mouth that really was interesting for people to look at. To watch. It was interesting for me to, to do. I, I kind of challenged myself to like get every like sniff and every like cough. It was a lot of fun. And that's when I got an agent. I signed with WME. I sold, you know, 100 tricks to appear smart meetings for a TV show. I sold how to be successful without hurting men's feelings to a TV show. I got a Netflix special. I got, you know, I got a chance to host Kimmel, um, guest host Kimmel, like literally everything that I'd ever wanted and more came true within the span of six months um, from when those videos started blowing up. Hearing Sarah's story, I thought about all the people sitting in their cubicles dreaming of having a different career, a career that they're actually passionate about, something that Sarah actually made happen. The advice I always say is, where does your mind go? What are you doing when you're supposed to be doing something else? Because I was supposed to be paying attention in a meeting, but I was writing down what everybody was doing in the meeting. It's like observing yourself. What do you do without anyone telling you to do that thing? And that's usually the thing that you should be doing. See if you can start doing that before you quit your job so that you can kind of figure out what you can do before you don't have that steady income coming in. Yeah, a friend said to me once, which really resonated with me, was whose career are you jealous of? And I knew immediately whose career I was jealous of. And I was like, that is what I should be doing. That is the thing that I should try to work towards. Everybody has heard about the perks that tech companies offer. And at Google, that means three free meals of truly delicious food every day. When we come back, we're going to take a deep dive into the Google cafeteria with the director of its food program. The food at Google, when you are working at Google. I have a friend that works there. She's brought me as a guest several times. And I cannot understand this life with all the free food. So talk about what it was like culinarily working at Google. I remember once trying to organize like a lunch for my team and we were going to like leave the office to go to lunch. And so I went to Yelp to look at like the best places to eat in the neighborhood. This was in Chelsea, the Chelsea neighborhood of New York. And I think the first two or three were the cafeterias in Google. (laughs) Like they actually were higher than actual restaurants. You would go to one floor for pizza and another floor for sushi. And, you know, if you wanted to go to sandwich, you'd go to the fifth floor. Like it was just, it was overwhelmingly amazing. And we really took it for granted, but it was a lot of food. It was a lot of food. They wanted it to be healthy. So like there was all of this information about the food. And then sometimes they'd have like a a day with like special food from like different countries and, and different themes. They just put so much effort into making it like as fun and as like filling as possible to, to work there. It reminds me of the dorms. It feels like eating at the dorms where there's all those different stations and there's soft serve and so much smoked salmon. I felt like you could have put it all together and made a whole new fish. Yeah. I mean, I hate smoked <laughs> salmon, but they had a lot, a lot of smoked salmon there. But the, like, yeah, breakfast, lunch, and then sometimes dinner. And then, of course, the micro kitchens just had snacks all day. So you were just very well fed. I mean, they just didn't want you to leave. People say that working in, at Google is like a cult and that the reason it feels like a cult is because they really don't want you to leave the building. And so they mm-hmm. make it as nice as possible so that you just want to stay there. And people would stay there all night or go there because of the meals. Google feeds 300,000 people a day in 60 countries. They serve food in their 400 cafes, which is what they call the dining halls, and 1,500 micro kitchens stocked with snacks. You don't pay for the meal. You you don't have to swipe anything or track what you're picking up for that day. It's a, a chance just to come in and relax, come together with friends. That's Matt Hood. Senior Director of the Google Food Program. We kind of trace it back to the early days when the founders said, hey, we want to start bringing people together through food. But it's been in the early 2000s that we've been doing this, so quite a while. It has just become this really pervasive part of the culture. Food is one of the ways that we see Googlers come together. Uh, They continue conversations on what they might be working on, deepen their relationships. The folklore is that Gmail was actually the idea for Gmail came together in one of our cafes. And so uh, we really see it as a hub for innovation. Uh, And it's been that way uh, since the early days. 
Employees are welcome to breakfast, lunch, and in many cases, dinner, with a huge variety of hot and cold dishes to choose from. I've become a big fan of our uh, chicken biryani, uh, which is something I had a chance to taste when I was in India, in our Indian cafe. Uh, and to see that brought across the, the globe uh, is pretty special. The same with uh, some of the uh, noodle concepts. So we'll have everything from ramen. Uh, we might have udon noodles or meat and potatoes, whether that's uh, a really great uh, rotisserie chicken with local fresh fruits and vegetables uh, surrounding it uh, tends to be showing up quite a bit. Uh, and then, you know, it's hard to get away from our, our good friends, uh, the Italians who, who love to showcase great pasta, great sauces, things that can really uh, amplify local flavors uh, and really bright, uh, rich cuisine. At Google's Mountain View headquarters, there are dozens of cafes, including a sit-down restaurant called Badal that actually requires a reservation. Badal serves what some folks online call California's best Indian food. The spaces and the places that you are able to sit and enjoy a meal. For example, uh, in New York City, our cafes, you can actually see the Statue of Liberty uh, out the window, right? And wow. so, so that's something you don't get to do every day uh, when you go to work and, and have lunch. Each campus offers a different menu that appeals to the tastes of the folks who work there. One of the favorite things that we get to do is make our Googlers feel seen. Mm -hmm. And just in the last few weeks, I got an email about a woman who went to the cafe in London and was blown away that there was a Ugandan dessert. And she was from Uganda. Mm -hmm. And so the ability to take recipes from around the world, but then put them into the cycle in a way that can really make people feel seen uh, and connect back to food from home, wherever that might be. I know there's been a trend of people from fine dining restaurants coming and taking jobs like this because they can have normal business hours. You know, it's easier to raise a family. Yeah, I think you hit the nail on the head, Rachel. We do want to provide an elevated service offering to our Googlers. And it's a great way to attract incredible culinary talent. Uh, some of the first chefs that I met when I uh, moved here to the Bay Area were chefs that had their own restaurants or had worked in fine dining. And I remember asking the team, like, how do we attract this amazing culinary talent? And it was just that. It was the fact that working in a place like Google affords you the opportunity to have your nights and weekends. It affords you the opportunity to still play in the creative space of, of culinary creation. But you get the benefit of not having that pressure of being there from open to close uh, seven days a week. Uh, they come so often with folks who end up starting their own uh, restaurants. And so we have a number of chefs around the world who have that type of background and that type of training, uh, many of whom have uh, earned their own Michelin stars. And, and today they're the, the stars of their own a cafe here at Google. Google has also worked hard in the background to nudge its employees into eating healthier. There's a really great article called How Google Got Its Employees to Eat Their Vegetables by Jane Black. It says in Google's micro kitchens, it takes 40 seconds for a cup of coffee to fill. And in that time, people would mindlessly grab a bunch of nearby snacks. So the person who was director of food at the time experimented. He moved the snack table 17 feet away from the coffee machine, and it reduced snacking by 23% for men and 17% for women. They strategically place veggie dishes first in a buffet line so that by the time you get to the meat and the sweets, your plate is already full of vegetables. They serve thousands of breakfast salads every day, and they serve spa water. You've seen it, water with cucumbers or strawberries, different fruits floating around in it. I have one of the uh, most enjoyable jobs maybe in the world. I get to take care of feeding our Googler population around the world uh, in 60 countries. And uh, it's, a, it's a great way to bring joy to a lot of people on a daily basis. <laughs> What's better, the Google cafeteria or craft services when you're working on a movie or a show? It's such a good question. Such a good question. Um, you know what? I'm going to have to say Google was better, but only because when you're on a movie set, you don't want to eat. That is the, the worst part about it is that it's great food, but you're about to be on camera, hopefully. <laughs> so you don't want to eat the food. Whereas at Google, all you're going to be is maybe like on a Zoom camera or like, you know, at your desk. And so eating and just sitting there working on your laptop went better together than craft services and being on camera. So I think yeah. about that sometimes when I am watching a movie, I always wonder, I wonder if someone has bad breath or I wonder if someone just ate a sandwich and like they had to cut because they burped or something. <laughs> 
I'm sure that happens. Yeah. <laughs> Never to me though, Hollywood. I'm really good on set, I promise. Just kidding. I smell amazing <laughs> out of my mouth. <laughs> yeah. After the break, Sarah Cooper's last meal and her favorite meal to eat, girl dinner. Well, Sarah Cooper, the big question of the show, what would your last meal be? Oh, yes. I um, feel like I really need to have some pizza. I would need to have some McDonald's cheeseburgers, two cheeseburger meal, um, fries, ketchup, obviously. For some reason, the ketchup in the actual packets, I think, is more delicious than um, in um, an actual ketchup bottle. Oh. So I would need the ketchup packets and uh, mint chocolate chip ice cream, some peanut butter chocolate chunk uh, granola bars. Oh, interesting. <laughs> I didn't see a granola That's bar really coming random. for dessert. Yeah. <laughs> I know. I love those granola bars. And I feel like maybe if that was the last time, I, I don't know, I probably would want one of those as well. Yeah. Are you talking about the chewy ones? Yes, okay. I yeah. Am. Like the you kind know, you get you in your school lunch. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. So how would your mom react listening to you talk about what your last meal would be? She would be like, Sierra, you know, see it, what I have to cook for you. You don't see one single thing I've cooked for you when you were young. You can't say one single thing. Okay, mom, I'll say one single thing. I will say she makes amazing um, liver and Johnny cakes and um, Kalaloo. I would actually add that as well. And if it's my mom's cooking, then that would be an amazing last meal. Actually, I would take that. Actually, you know, spiritually speaking, I would get rid of everything I just said and have that because I feel okay. like if I'm about to die, like I should have my mother's cook. If I could have my mother's cooking as my last meal, I think I would actually do that. That's an interesting choice, though, because for someone who doesn't really like Jamaican food much and doesn't like cooking, that you want liver is really surprising to me because some, that's something I feel like a lot of people don't like. When I think about what a liver is, I can't eat it. But when I forget that part and just it's it's very tasty, it's very good for you. And I love the way that my mom makes it. I wish I was more Jamaican. So maybe in my last moments, like it's my last grasp at my culture, you know, so that's what it would be. For her last meal, Sarah Cooper wants her mom's liver, Johnny Cakes, and Callaloo. Editor's note, I actually came back into the studio and recorded this after listening to the first draft because I want you to know that she doesn't want to eat her mom's liver. She wants to eat the liver her mom cooks. For the record, Sarah Cooper is not a cannibal. Sarah said she prefers to eat a bunch of snacks for a meal, a little bit of everything, which is why she's a fan of girl dinner, a trending hashtag on TikTok and Instagram. Yeah, I just found out about it on TikTok, actually. This girl was like, describing her boyfriend always wants to eat dinner, but she just wants to like, you know, snack and like take a little bit of this and a little bit of that. And I was like, that's what I've been doing my whole life. Like, I yeah. feel like I've always wanted to do that. So I feel like whenever I'm in a relationship, that's like the worst argument ever is like, what are we going to eat for dinner? It's a conversation that I don't want to have. It's mind numbing. It's excruciating. I don't want to talk about it. You know what I mean? So me and my ex, we would just, we had like three different places we would rotate between or whatever. But for me, like sometimes cheese and crackers, chicken nuggets is a big one. I also have like girl breakfast, which is just like yogurt with some granola and um, maybe just a latte sometimes, you know, like... And it's not like I'm dieting. It's just that I feel like I, there are other things I want to do. Now, I will pig out on some pizza. Tacos, I've ordered tacos the past two days. <laughs> but I don't cook, so I don't know. It's just girl dinner is kind of where I'm at. Yeah, it's more of like an assemblage of a meal instead of cooking. Like just bringing together all these parts. And like everybody loves a charcuterie board. I feel like it's kind of like that for dinner. Exactly. It's like a charcuterie bird, except, yeah. But with chicken nuggets. Really don't like salami. <laughs> yeah, but with chicken nuggets and honey mustard sauce. And the, the thing that, that I did discover is a cracker with a piece of Gouda cheese and a little a dollop of uh, honey. That is a, that's a good snack. What is the definition of a girl dinner? 
So a girl dinner, textbook definition, I would say, is a low-maintenance meal, typically a collection of snacks, side dishes, and small portions that satisfy the exact cravings of the eater. And, and like for me, it's a range of textures. I, it's grazing. I want crunchy and I want soft. I want a bit of salty. I want that sweet. That's Olivia Marr, creator of Girl Dinner. I've always called a girl dinner to myself. I think it's mm-hmm. just from Cockerel Walk, Cockerel Summer. And it was something that I did alone. And I'm a girl. And it felt fun because my boyfriend never eats that way with me. And it, he was he was at the gym. And I was alone. And I was like, girl dinner. And I was like, I can't be the only person that does this. And I just felt like it would be one of those perfectly relatable moments where hair's a mess. I'm in my kitchen, baggy t-shirt, whatever. I'm just going to throw it out there. I recorded it in the TikTok app and sent it out right then. And then uh, here we are. (laughs) Olivia's Girl Dinner video has millions of views. There have been countless spinoffs and Girl Dinner has been covered everywhere from the New York Times to the Today Show. Meet the Girl Dinner, a TikTok sensation that has women everywhere saying dinner "Dinner for one. Girl Dinner. Girl Dinner. No cooking, no cleanup, only indulgence. It was a summer of femininity with Barbie and the Taylor Swift Eras tour and Beyonce and now girl dinner. Here's the thing. Everybody has had a meal like this. Everybody has pulled little bits of leftovers out of the fridge to make up a meal or had cheese and crackers for dinner. Olivia didn't invent the concept, but she gave it a name and it resonated. And why is it called girl dinner? Because it just feels so deeply feminine to eat this way and to basically take a moment for yourself. You, I think as women, we have been told a lot uh, what to eat and what not to eat and how to cook and how to be, to be a good woman or a good, you know, housemaker and homemaker. And this is stepping away from that and just going, actually what I want right now is not any of that. And I want a simplified version and I want exactly what I want. And I'm going to have that. I have to admit, I felt a bit of an ick when I first heard the name Girl Dinner. I am not a big fan of gendering food. You know, the idea that steaks are for men and salads are for women and women not ordering what they really want when they're out on a date. And critics of Girl Dinner have said that it looks like disordered eating, which I personally don't agree with. Some people are saying Girl Dinner is an act of feminism. Women eating exactly what they feel like eating and choosing not to cook and clean. Girl dinner represents a conscious choice to opt out of the tyranny of cooking and doing the dishes. It's also, conveniently, the answer to fridge cleanout day. That's Jessica Roy. I wrote an article called, Is it a meal, a snack? No, it's girl dinner for the New York Times. What's an example of a girl dinner that you have had recently? I actually live in Paris, and Paris is sort of like the capital of the girl dinner. They have like dinatoire, which is basically the French version of a girl dinner where you have a bunch of appetizers for dinner. So I like to go to the market and get a couple of different kinds of fruits. So in the summer, some peaches, a bunch of olives, like a good baguette, a good hunk of cheese. And that's really like my favorite, favorite way to eat, especially in the summer. So Popeye's actually the fast food chain um, in July after the story came out, they started offering their own version of girl dinner, which was basically just the ability to take a variety of different sides that they had, like mashed potatoes and things like that, and turning it into a girl dinner. I wish all restaurants would do this because when I go out, I'm always deciding between five or six dishes. And I've always said like the best restaurant concept would be like a little of this and a little of that. So I know it's not really like that great of a financial plan for restaurants to serve food like that, but the girl dinner model is really where it's at. I would love just like two bites of everything. Do you know what I mean? And so I totally agree. I think if there, if a restaurant could figure out how to um, sort of capitalize on that and serve like tiny portions of six different things, I, I think that would do really well. That's basically a buffet. So maybe there needs to be the invention of a gourmet fancy buffet. Like actually there's a place in Seattle. They stopped doing this during the pandemic, but it's a really nice restaurant. And for their Sunday brunches, if you ordered an entree, you had access to this fancy kind of small buffet where every month it was featuring a food from a different country. And that was so fun because usually buffets, it's either Vegas or Atlantic City or... Right. It's not like highest quality food necessarily. Yeah. But I guess that's the best way to just get a little bit of everything. Yeah. So basically, I'm, I'm hearing that the next trend that we need to bring back is like a fancy buffet. 
I can see that catching on because it has the kind of kitsch factor. No, totally. I mean, you have the New York Times. Let's get this out there. <laughs> Let's do it. <laughs> Olivia says she sometimes gets asked, well, what's boy dinner then? Like, what does boy dinner look like? Um, it's farts. It's farts for dinner. We were like, Mountain Dew and, and Domino's. And I'm like, yeah. <laughs> it's its own huge trend on its own. Uh, I just saw one that was said boy dinner, and it was two plates of steak cut into cubes, like, and a gallon of chocolate milk. Boy dinner. Oh, <laughs> I kind of so. like it now that the chocolate milk's there. <laughs> After chatting with Olivia and Jessica and hearing the backstory of how the name came to be, calling it Girl Dinner doesn't really bother me anymore. But if I was going to put a name to this universal behavior, me standing at the kitchen counter eating bits and bobs pulled from my cupboards in the refrigerator, I would probably call it Raccoon Dinner. I had a raccoon lunch today. As I was working, I got up at least five times to scrounge around for a snack that I wasn't actually hungry for a leftover slice of pizza made in the uni pizza oven. It was broccolini and chicken Italian sausage, if you care to know. I got up for a handful of pretzels. I got up for half an apple. I had a few spoonfuls of this chocolate tahini sauce that I tested for my cookbook. I had a chunk of mozzarella wrapped in a basil leaf sprinkled with salt. So for me, it's not so much girl dinner as procrastination snacking that leaves me not hungry for regular dinner. This is my meal. I call this girl dinner. Girl, girl, dinner. girl, dinner. girl dinner. Girl dinner. Girl dinner. Oh, girl dinner. Let's get back to Sarah. You do talk about chicken nuggets a lot in the book. It comes up. It comes up. Yeah, several times. Yeah, I'm, <laughs> I, I'm just a chicken nugget person. I'm, I'm actually, I'm more of a honey mustard dressing person. And the chicken nuggets are really just a vehicle for my addiction to honey mustard. Yes. So you said that you love condiments and you basically eat just for an excuse for condiments. What are your favorites besides the honey mustard? Ketchup. I love ketchup. Very good. Um, I like any kind of aioli. <laughs> any kind of aioli. I love saying the word aioli. I know you do um, like a little dance too. I like the aioli dance. I, aioli. <laughs> That's my macarena, yeah. <laughs> which I can't even say for some reason. Um, but yeah, I like uh, those are my three top ones. Yeah, but any kind of in yeah any kind of condiment I like. So something. Duck sauce. Oh, and so duck sauce is such an East Coast thing. Like my mom's from New York, and I've lived on the West Coast my whole life. No one knows what duck sauce is here. Really? Yeah. Nobody. Oh, you don't see it anywhere. So no one says it. And I remember as a kid, I would say it when I would come back from New York, and everybody was confused. You have to move. I know. We have ducks. You have to move. But no duck sauce. <laughs> that is a deal breaker for me. Um, yeah. To just be reminded constantly by seeing the ducks and not having any duck sauce. No so sauce. Sad. Yeah. I guess what is it? Is it sweet and sour sauce is kind of what it is? I feel like that's different. I feel like duck sauce is sweeter and then sweet and, and sour. Look. Just I don't know. Duck sauce is a condiment with a sweet and sour flavor and a translucent orange appearance, similar to a thin jelly. Thin mm. jelly. It says it's not quite the same as sweet and sour sauce, but the flavors are pretty similar. Okay, before I let you go, I'm going to do a fast little speed round, a food related okay. speed round. Um, what is your perfect birthday cake? It is uh, those little mini cupcakes from the grocery store, vanilla with uh, white icing and the little like um, rainbow sprinkles. That's so yes. funny because I was thinking, is she going to say like a log cabin made out of Twinkies with a little ho-ho chimney or? <laughs> oh, no, I hate Twinkies. I hate ho-hos. I absolutely not. <laughs> I don't like them either. <laughs> what is your favorite movie theater snack? Uh, well, I go to Alamo Draft House and um, I eat pizza and chocolate chip cookies. So I don't even know if that's a snack, but it's a full meal. And that's what I like. <laughs> Have you ever, you know, as somebody who made their career on social media, have you ever cooked or tried a TikTok food trend or recipe? I haven't. I love watching people make things, but I just love watching. I'm mm -hmm. a watcher. I don't I don't need to try it. I, I'm good. <laughs> so no, I haven't <laughs> tried anything. And as you mentioned in the book, um, you like to smoke weed or take edibles. What is your favorite stoner snack? Oh, um, I do love a peanut butter banana smoothie. And you make it yourself? That's kind of one of, I make it myself. I get a frozen banana, about a cup of oat milk, and um, about two tablespoons of peanut butter. And it's very delicious. 
And that was Sarah Cooper's last meal. Her new memoir, Foolish, is out now. Why is it called Foolish? Working with Jerry Seinfeld, and one of the things he said to me was like, this is the business of being embarrassed. Getting up on stage to do stand-up comedy and speaking into a mic in front of a crowd of strangers, your most personal, personal things like that you've ever said, that's insane. It is humiliating, but I did it, and I kept trying to hide the embarrassment I've just been trying to appear smart all the time. Like, I'm even trying to appear smart right now. Like, do I sound smart? I hope so. <laughs> you know, like, I I can't get out of this mode of just, like, wanting to sound like I know what I'm talking about and look like I know what I'm doing all the time. And going into the entertainment world, I'm going to use a word that I've never used before, but I feel like it, it would work here. Anathema. Oh, you do did sound smart. <laughs> It's a big word. Boom. I don't know Um, what it means. You're smarter than me. (laughs) You know, looking smart isn't interesting to watch. Mm. You know what I mean? We want to see people's pain, their quirks. I named it foolish as an aspirational thing for me. I would like to be more foolish in Mm. my life. But also, I was mocking the biggest fool I've ever seen in my life. And that's how a lot of people know me. And so I was fool-ish by lip syncing a fool. Sarah also is a part in the upcoming Jerry Seinfeld Netflix movie, Unfrosted, the Pop-Tart story. Sarah Cooper, thank you so much. It was so lovely speaking with you. And I like your shirt a lot too, as a side note. It's very cute. And Taylor Loft, you guys. What? Stars, they're just like (laughs) us. Oh, you called me a star. Thank you so much. That's so sweet. You're welcome. Thanks to Matt Hood, Senior Director of the Food Program at Google. Olivia Mark, creator of The Girl Dinner Trend. And writer Jessica Roy. If you've made it this far, chances are you like the show. So before you go, please leave a quick review on Apple Podcasts. It is a free, easy, and meaningful way to support the podcast. Your Last Meal was created and hosted by me and is a product of Cascade Public Media in Seattle. Editing and production assistance from Sarah Bernard. Our original theme music is by Prom Queen. Make sure you're following along on Instagram, Hello Rachel Bell, and subscribe to my Substack newsletter to find out about events, giveaways, and other fun stuff. That's rachelbell.substack.com. I'm Rachel Bell, and this is Your Last Meal. Well, I still don't know that word used earlier, so it's going to haunt me for the rest of the day. I'm pretty sure I used it wrong. Say it again. Anathema. Anathema. I'm going to write it down and add it to my vocabulary. I don't know. Were you going to ask about my my last meal? Oh, I can. I don't usually yes. do it, but I can. Yeah. What would your last meal be? Um, my mother makes an incredible feta dip. Unreal. Bear with me here. A Chili's El Presidente Margarita because I <laughs> love cooking and I love making things from scratch. That's how I grew up. That's what my mom did. So I just sometimes love the classic like American chain style eating. Yeah. Um, charcuterie board, of course, but with Iberico ham, um, actually like from, you know, Spain, oysters, and then a Dutch food called, I might butcher it, but it's hakbala, which is basically a meatball, um, with a mustard gravy and a kale mashed potato to go with it. That is, that would be I like it. 